Okay. Well, good morning, Grace Life. Good to see you. Good morning. You're a little more lively than first service. Hopefully I am too. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to be continuing in Galatians today. Um, so uh, if you want to open your Bibles to chapter 6 or have an app or something, that's fine. It'll also be on the screen. All right. So <clears throat> I'll try to stay focused and not jumbled here. I've got notes and screen control here, so I've got to make sure... I squeeze everything in from the paper and not get it ruffled up. So anyways, all right, we're going to read the passage really quick. And um, I'm going to be a little old school here. Can we stand for the reading of God's word? Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but in sometimes like more liturgical churches, the passage is read and then the minister says, this is God's word. Do you know what you guys say after that? Praise Praise be to God. All right, let's try it. Okay. All right. So starting in verse 11, you guys see this verse on the screen? It's still following me? Okay. Um, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. This is God's word. All right. (laughs) Grab a seat. (laughs) <laughs> you did well. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll just go over a few of the themes we've talked about so far in Galatians as Derek has preached through it and a few other guys. Um, <clears throat> so one of the biggest, you know, obviously themes we've touched on is law versus grace. Um, very often we want to move away from the gospel and start moving into things to justify ourselves that have to do with the law and have to do with obedience in order to prove our worth before God, but in, throughout Galatians we've seen that it's through grace, and by grace through faith that we're saved, um, and uh, the law and obedience and things like that become a fruit of our salvation, and so that's obviously something we've touched on, and I'm sure we'll touch on it some more today. Um, also, you know, condemnation versus liberty, walking under, uh, feeling condemned or feeling or being condemned before God versus walking in freedom and knowing that uh, God is on our side. Uh, But today, we're going to talk about new creation versus old creation. Okay, this is, I think, this issue, union with Christ and being a new creature, new creation versus old creation, it's really sort of the answer to the question people are always asking, you know, what can I get away with if I'm under grace? Uh, You know, how much of the law, you know, do I still have to follow? If I'm saved by grace, can I just go ahead and sin? This, knowing Christ and, and Paul's and the other apostles, you know, teaching on this, really sort of balances that out and relieves that tension because we know what the way God is actually working. So um, so really, what I want to point out is Paul does not want to tear down holiness and promote unholiness. Okay, often we think that's the theme, like, okay, we're not under law anymore. God's lowered the standard, so now we can just do these things and it's not as hard and we can get in. You know, that's not the contrast Paul's making. It's holiness versus uh False holiness, true holiness, and false holiness. And I think we're going to see that a little bit more as we go through this. So what I want to do as we walk through this, I sort of saw like two themes I wanted to touch on. I wanted to contrast Paul and the Judaizers throughout this, what Paul's motives are as the teacher and what the Judaizers' uh, motives are, uh, and show the differences and really just see how that applies to us, you know, not just as teachers, but as people being taught and know like how are we supposed to walk in the gospel in this way. So, <clears throat> Paul claimed to want to put the Galatians in right standing with God, right? That's sort of like what he does as he presents the gospel. He says, I want to put you in right standing with God, that you would have peace with God. The problem is that the Judaizers claim to want the same thing. If you do these things, you'll be at peace with God. So, they kind of have the same goal in mind, or at least they claim to. Okay, and so, uh, the question becomes, you know, what, what, what is the difference in their motivation for reaching that goal. I want to point out three things. What's their motivation first for reaching that goal? Paul versus the Judaizers. What's the difference in their means of reaching that goal? And then finally, 
what kind of priority do they put on reaching that goal? Okay, how important is it to Paul? How important is it to the Judaizers? Okay. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll read the first half again because this is more focused on the Judaizers and then we'll move on to the next half where we talk about Paul later on. Okay, so in uh, the first half he says, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. A lot, of, a lot of scholars believe Paul, from a few things he said in a few books, they believe that he had like bad eyesight. Uh, if you read Romans, you see at the end it says, another guy basically said, I'm transcribing this letter. Paul's not the one actually writing it. He's speaking it and I'm writing it. Um, but Paul's saying in Galatia, to the Galatians, I wrote this letter. That's why the, the letters are so big, so you can read it. I wanted to personally send this message to you. That's how important it is. Okay? It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Okay, so to start out... <clears throat> Uh, what was the Judaizers' motivation, according to this passage? I'll point out a few. Uh, the Judaizers cared about their appearance before others. Okay? So it said, uh, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. They cared about, you know, those that they had come from. They cared about, you know, the community that had not fully embraced the gospel, and they wanted to please them and, you know, show, like, look, our followers are holy. You know, they follow these laws. And that's how they're justified before God, okay? <clears throat> uh, so we, I, what I noticed, like, we're going to be reading a lot, a lot of, of Scripture in this, in this message. Because what I found, uh, first of all, Romans, uh, a lot of people say Romans and Galatians are sort of like brother and sister books. Uh, what you see sort of summarized in Galatians, you see Paul's thoughts much more expanded and developed in Romans. So we're going to, Romans sort of became a commentary for me for Galatians. So I'll read some passages from there, but also from the Gospels. Uh, because we'll see that the Judaizers really are paralleled in their attitudes in a lot of ways by the Pharisees. Um, so uh, I'll give you an example here. Um, the Judaizers cared about their appearance before others, and the Pharisees acted much the same way. So we'll look into, uh, this is Matthew 23. Okay, this is when Jesus is talking to the people about the Pharisees. He says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Uh, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. So Jesus, like, will notice, like I said before, this isn't a matter of going from uh, the law and holiness to the law is bad and unholiness is good, okay? Because Jesus is saying here, uh, you know, observe whatever they tell you to do, the Pharisees who sit on Moses' seat because they're preaching from the law of God. It's a good thing. But not the works they do, for they preach but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger, they do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor and feasts, uh, at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Um, so there's, there's, you know, sort of a, an example from the New Testament there of, you know, people doing things for appearance's sake. But I have a, a modern example here I want to show you really quick uh, that you might recognize. <clears throat> So. Number 49. You know, uh, my last name is Costanza. That's Italian. So uh, you and I are kind of like countrymen. Eh? Paisanos. <laughs> 650 your change. Ah, yes. And I always take care of my paisano. So here's a little something. Antonio! Si! Vieni qua! Questa miserable patrone qua! No, no, sono andato qua! Aspetta, guarda l'atole! Hey! Hey! You steal my money? No, 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 you don't understand. I wasn't trying to take it no, out. No, I know what you tried to do. No, no, no. no get out of here. Don't but, come back here again, no, ever. No, no, oh. no. All right, there you go. Um, just a, I think it's a good illustration, isn't it? <laughs> George is like a great illustration for a lot of things. But anyways, um, okay, so that, that's, one, that's one motivation is this appearance before others. The second one I want to point out is that their motivation was to avoid persecution. Just remember they said that they would force you to be circumcised uh, in, order to, in order that they might, might not be persecuted for the cross of Christ because it was so offensive and leaving behind all of these laws. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, again, this is mirrored by the Pharisees. We'll look at another passage. Um, let me see here. So this will be from uh, Matthew 21. I actually, I, I spoke on this passage um, when I was in seminary, so I'll use a similar illustration as well. Uh, but I really like, I always like 
passages where Jesus is sort of debating with the Pharisees because you see the way he thinks and the way he's able to address, address them. So, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come, from heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. End of the conversation. So it's interesting. You look at the Pharisees, they go aside, and they talk about the question uh, Jesus asked them. And the questions they were asking each other was not, what, what's the answer? Their question was not, where does John's power come from? They weren't actually talking to each other about what Jesus asked. They, they were talking about how do we avoid humiliation? How do we avoid persecution, as it were? Okay, so uh, there's, um, there's a little illustration I, this reminded me of that um, I remember when I was, I must have been probably nine or so, my sister was still a toddler. Uh, and uh, we were, uh, I, had a, I had this really nice little train set with um, a little electric train would go around it in a circle and uh, you know, I would put the pieces together in different shapes and you know, in those days, me and my sister, basically, our relationship was just bickering and stuff like that. Um, and, but my mom would sort of force us to play together so we'd get along. And uh, so one time she's like, you're going to let your sister come down and play with you and play with a train set. And I was like, I really don't want her to. She's going to break it. And she's like, no, you're going to sit down and you're going to play with your, with your sister. I was like, fine. So sure enough, my sister starts putting the pieces together in a little tab that connects the train set. I'm embarrassing her. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> It snapped off, and of course, I stormed around the room huffing and puffing. I was just filled with rage, and so I said, okay, I'm going to grab this tinker toy I found over here, and I'm going to throw it at her neck. So I whipped it at her neck, and she ran up the stairs screaming and crying. <clears throat> and so eventually, of course, I heard, Eric, come upstairs. And I came upstairs, and my mom said, your sister said that you pinched her. Is that true? And I said... Nope. <laughs> she said, I'm going to ask you again. I know you're lying. Did you pinch your sister? No. I'm going to ask you one more time, a third time. Did you pinch your sister? Nope. You've lied to me three times now. We're going to call dad. So I called dad on the phone at work. Eric, you've been lying to your mom? I'm like, no. Did you pinch your sister? No, I didn't pinch her. I threw a tinker toy at her. <laughs> <laughs> so he loved that response. He's right there, actually. <laughs> So, anyways, notice I was telling the truth, but the issue was not the truth, okay? It was the avoidance of pain, okay? So, you get the idea. Okay, that's another motive of the, uh, of the Judaizers. <clears throat> it was, a third motivation was that their motive was to receive glory from human beings, okay? And uh, let me see here. <clears throat> so, I'll give you one more scriptural example of how Jesus talked about this. This is from John, um, Pharisees were rebuked for the same thing. John 5, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. As it is, uh, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? So you see the way the Pharisees, and I'd say the Judaizers as well, interacted was they would receive someone who comes in their own name for their own glory because they know that's how they function too. But if Paul comes, or someone who wants God's approval and is in it for God's glory, then they know that those two things cannot exist together and one of them will be exposed. And so... I obviously didn't like Paul very much. <clears throat> okay, so that, those are the motivations of, of the Judaizers. It's this human appearance. It's uh, avoiding pain, avoiding persecution, and uh, and it's ultimately their own glory, you know, and being glorified by man and not by, not by God. Okay. <clears throat>
So what was the means that the Judaizers used to put, to apparently, you know, put the Galatians in right standing with God? I'll just run through a few things. Basically, we know they used the law. They would, uh, you know, obviously we're giving these standards again that had been fulfilled in Christ uh, and basically making them the ground of justification, the ground of salvation before God. So they used the law, and because they used the law, they used force. That's the word that Paul used. They would force you to be, become circumcised, and there's, you know, obviously all kinds of force. Um, things like uh, fear, you know, obviously if you don't follow this standard, then hell is clearly on the way. Um, and, you know, along with fear, there's manipulation. I mean, I'm sure many of us have experienced manipulation in different church circles for different reasons. Uh, and then ultimately, together, hypocrisy and lies were what they used. And I'll show you what I mean. Again, go back, we'll go back over to Romans here in chapter 2, um, where, again, Paul sort of just expands on this idea again. He's basically rebuked the world uh, in the first <clears throat> and much of the second chapter. And then he turns to the, the Jews and says, but you're not, you're not better either, and this is why. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law, and boast in God, and know his will, and approve what is excellent, because you are instructed from the law, as if, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And you know, this just perfectly parallels you know, what he says about the Judaizers. Basically, those who are circumcised do not themselves follow the law. Okay, so uh, another <laughs> little illustration. Uh, I remember uh, I was homeschooled my whole life along with my siblings. And, well, not quite my sister. She split off a little bit, but I remember I was being punished for something, probably fighting for my si- fighting with my sister, I don't know, um, but I remember I was sent to my room, and I'm laying in my bed, and uh, I'm like, okay, I have to be here for whatever my mom said, an hour, something like that. Um, I know, we have this pencil box we use for school, and it's really tattered and messed up. I'm going to get out of bed, I'm going to go upstairs, and I'm going to fix it, because my mom would really like that. So I went upstairs, and I taped it up, and I showed my mom. And she's, I could just see on her face, it was like, yeah, okay, thanks. That's not what I told you to do, though. <laughs> it's this idea that there's this outward thing you do in order to sort of stuff down what you actually know God's requiring of you. It's that idea. All right, so um, this moves us on to the question, what was the Judaizers' priority? Why were they, why were they, trying, to, um, why were they trying to bring the, the Galatians to an, apparently a, a good relationship with God? We talked about their motives and their means of doing it, but how important was it actually for them? Okay. So this is sort of repeating what we said, but this is more asking, what's the priority? Their ultimate priority, again, was their fame rather than the glory of God. Their priority was their own safety. And their priority was <clears throat> their own glory. Okay, so this brings up the question then. Um, well, what, 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 we, what we see is that the holiness of the Galatians was a means to the Judaizers' benefit. Okay, so that, that brings up the question. If they could have had the benefit without the means, you know, would they have cared about the means? I mean, if they could have had safety, if they could have had glory, if they could have had good appearances, would they have cared at all about what the Galatians were doing? Probably what could have just done without the Galatians. The Galatians were a means, not the end for them. Okay. <clears throat> and so now we're going to contrast that with Paul. Okay. The second half of this passage, Paul talks about what his priorities are, what his motivation is, what his means is. Okay. So <clears throat> in the second half, in verse 15, he says, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. All right, so let's dig into that. <clears throat> so what is Paul's motivation here? What does he say? He says, first off, his motivation was to make much of the cross. Far be it from me to boast except 
in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and so rather than boasting in his own flesh, his own works, or boasting, in, boasting even in the holiness of the Galatians uh, because of his works, he's boasting in the cross of Christ because whatever holiness is found in the congregation or in him is because of the cross of Christ. Okay. And m- Paul's motivation was God's approval, not man's approval. I think earlier in Galatians he said, uh, you know, I would not be preaching the cross if my goal was to please man. Because there's much better ways to please man than to preach the cross. It's not his motivation. And so again, his, his thoughts on circumcision, are, again, are paralleled in Romans 2. We'll go back to that chapter and read really quick. Um, okay. For circumcision, indeed, is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So pretty much what he's saying, if you take this and you couple it with what he's saying in Galatians, what he's ultimately saying is, you who have faith in Christ, who are being made new, who have been justified by grace through faith and are in right standing with God, you have more authority to condemn the Judaizers than they have of you. Because they have these outward appearances, but they themselves do not keep the law that they're requiring of you. It's hypocrisy. But in Christ, the Galatians are keeping the law. So what is Paul's means of bringing about this right standing with God? Unlike the Judaizers, which it was the law for justification and, you know, keeping up appearances, things like that. Paul's means, he believed in death and rebirth like Christ taught. Okay, so we're going to point out, again, this is, this is really what gives you the balance you need as you, cont- as you walk in Christ, as you walk in the gospel, and the question comes up, you know, can I get away with this, can I get away with this? The question changes when you think in terms of creation and new creation. Okay, because when we're united with Christ, well, let's see what Paul says. This is Romans 6. He says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Notice he asks the question, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? No. He doesn't say no because if you hit a certain point, you lose your salvation. This many sins and no more. He says, how can dead people sin? That's the question. The question is, why would you ask If you are a new creation, why would you ask what you can get away with? If you're united with Christ and he's changing your inner desires, why would you ask, what can I get away with? That's the wrong question. So here's another example in Romans 8. There's a couple chapters later. for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Not ho- now hope that is seen is not hope, but for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That's Romans 8, 18 to 25. So we see this idea that in Christ, we're not looking for these outward, conf- uh, outward laws, outward standards to conform us. We're looking at this inward groaning of the spirit for a new creation, that we already are being made new. And that when we see a command of God or something like that, we don't see it as a grounds for justification. We don't see it as a means of God's approval. We see it as a fruit of what he's doing in our lives. Um, I do want to try to find where I was here, so I do this right. Okay, so there's the passage. So I am in the right spot. Good. 
Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, again, this echoes Jesus' teaching on the new birth in Romans 3. I want to point out, in a lot of, uh, I mean, I've been, to, I've been to seminary a bit, and um, a lot of what you would call, you know, liberal scholars like to pit certain authors of the Bible against each other. And they basically will say, Jesus had the gospel in the gospels, and he preached his message, and then Paul took it, and he added all this doctrine and theology, and he distorted the message of Jesus. Okay, but as I, as I read Galatians and as I read you know, John, I see just a perfect parallel between Paul's teaching and Jesus' teaching. Okay, Jesus taught the new birth, Paul taught the new birth, but didn't use the same words. He talked about new creation, things like that. It's pretty amazing. Um, I want to use a little, a little illustration of what I'm talking about. When I, when I was uh, about 14, 15 years old, uh, me and my family lived in Bosnia um, for about a year and a half, 02 to 03, and I remember I didn't really want to go. I was, you know, crying. I didn't want to leave my family. or I didn't want to leave my friends and the church I was in, things like that. Um, but I was happy I got to bring my Nintendo 64 along. That was good. Um, so I did that, and I took it, and I, what a lot of people don't know, I did know it when I brought it, but a lot of people don't know that. The uh, power supply there is like, it comes out at 220, whatever that means, and uh, the American is like 110. I don't know what that means, but that's what it was called, anyways. But uh, anyways, I had a little adapter that was supposed to work, and I plugged my Nintendo 64 into the wall. I'm like, okay, I got something American here while we're here. This is nice. And so I put in Tony Hawk and started playing, and after a few minutes, poof, smoke starts rising out of it. Um, and so many tears were shed, I think, over that. Um, and to, and, but ultimately, the problem was, you know, I was operating in a, you know, the wrong side of the world with this equipment, you know, and it just wasn't designed for it. And ultimately, that's what happens when we try to follow the law, you know, when we're supposed to be new creation, a new creation, you know, we're operating with, you know, the wrong hardware. You know, we're supposed to, we're designed for a particular world, but we're living in the wrong world. And until we see ourselves as citizens of heaven, you know, the equipment is not going to line up. I'll put it that way. And we'll find ourselves using the wrong means, the wrong methodologies to find holiness. The wrong motivations, the wrong means, the wrong priorities, as we're talking about here. Okay, <clears throat> so. Uh, so Paul knew that we are not simply to try to outwardly conform to the law. Okay? We are to be born from above so that we love God's law. Now, you know, oftentimes, again, we contrast the wrong things. We think... The law was in the Old Testament, uh, and then God sort of, his moral standards kind of changed. He lowered the moral standard, and now we don't have to be as holy, but, you know, that's what grace is. But no, it's, it's the wrong questions that are being asked. Ultimately, all of the law was fulfilled in Christ. You know, the ceremonial laws were fulfilled in Christ, circumcision, all, all, the, all that symbolized was fulfilled in Christ, and he changes us so that the moral law becomes what we love from inside of our hearts. So the moral standard is fulfilled in Christ and it is still what Christians are to find beautiful, but it is not the ground of their justification. Okay. And so <clears throat> it's, it's always important to contrast those because that's the difference between true holiness and false holiness is the motivation, the reason we, we follow the law, things like that. Okay. So what was Paul's priority here? We talked about his motivation. We talked about the means that he believed in. What was Paul's priority? So notice he says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. What does that say? Notice that Paul was willing to suffer. You know, I think when he says, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus, he was talking like he was beaten and, you know, persecuted because of the message he was preaching, much like Jesus was. Okay, he, bear, he bears on his body and relates to Christ on that level. Obviously, Jesus, he doesn't accomplish the same things by his suffering that Jesus accomplished, but he, we have a similarity when we walk with Christ in the suffering we have. Remember in Romans 8, provided we suffer it with him in order that we may be glorified with him. So Paul was willing to suffer so that the, the Galatians would know the true gospel. And this so strongly contrasts the, the Judaizers. The Judaizers preached a false gospel in order to avoid suffering. Absolute dichotomy between law and grace. When you're following the law, when you're centered on yourself, when you're centered on man, you do what it takes to avoid suffering. But when you have hope in Christ and you see a new world coming, heaven coming, new creation coming, and you look to the cross, you're willing to go through any kind of suffering to share that message because you know the end is different. 
Okay, so what was Paul's conclusion in all this? Let me jump forward. <clears throat> Notice what he says here just before that. As for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, I'm, now I'm pretty sure that uh, in the Greek, the grammar makes it very, very clear that here, the Israel of God and all who walk by this rule are considered the same group. Okay, as for all who walk by this rule, you, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. In other words, it's another title for those who walk by this rule, for those who believe the message Paul has. Okay, so what does that mean? <clears throat> so God's means to his glory is not a single ethnic group that begrudgingly submits to his commands. That's not his goal. His goal is not for you to suck it up, follow the rules, and even if you're miserable, so long as you follow the rules, you're fine. No. His goal is a people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation who are a new creation, who live in a new creation, we will someday, and who love the way God governs his creation. We love his law because we know it's for our good. We love his ways because we know they're for our good. And we know that they don't justify us. We know that Christ justified us. Christ makes us a new creation. <clears throat> okay, so Paul calls this people the Israel of God. We see a little bit more of this um, in Romans 9. So Romans 9, it comes after Romans 8, obviously, where you see these promises to all, the, to, to, you know, all God's people of him keeping them, you know, tribulation, nakedness, sword, all these, all these things that will, that will make it through because Christ has us and all these promises have been made to us. So someone might bring up the question then, after reading that chapter, well, the Jewish people, you know, as a whole, you know, obviously there were exceptions like Paul, um, who, you know, who ultimately, though, the, the people of Israel rejected their Messiah. And so didn't these promises to Israel ultimately fail? Isn't, isn't that what happened? So how can we trust the promises to us in Romans 8, the people of God now, if the people of God in the Old Testament and the Israelites didn't receive their Messiah and the word of God apparently failed for them? So Paul answers that question in Romans 9. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. Here's your answer. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. And later in the chapter he says, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will, call my, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. So we see in this passage it was always God's plan that his people would be made up of those who walk by faith according to the, in the footsteps of Abraham and that would be made up of a people both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. And that includes the Galatians. Okay. <clears throat> so, some closing questions to sum up what we've gone through here. Are you seeking the truth in the gospel, the true gospel, or are you seeking safety before the world? Between teachers who would put a yoke on you of a false gospel, are you wanting safety from persecution or are you seeking the truth? Are you seeking what Christ really taught, what Paul is really teaching here? Are you seeking your fame or are you seeking God's glory? Because if you follow the law, you feel accomplished and you feel like you can spread your fame, but God constructed the gospel in such a way that we trust in him and he is accomplishing something in our lives by making us holy. He still loves holiness. He still loves his law. It's, it's according to his character, but he is fulfilling it in Christ and he's cr making a new creation in you, but he gets the glory for that. Oftentimes we hold on to the law because we want to hold on to our own glory. So are you seeking your fame or are you seeking God's glory? <clears throat> Next, are you seeking praise from man or praise from God? Similar question. Does it make you joyous on the inside when someone compliments you, when someone praises the apparent holiness of your life more, or does it please you to know that whatever someone's saying to you, God approves of you because you're in Christ? And are you seeking begrudging submission to God's law or a love for God's law? Have you settled for the idea that I'm going to follow these rules here, this is how Christians act, 
and I don't care if I'm happy just so long as I do it? Or are you seeking a vision of Christ that makes you love his law, that transforms you? Are you seeking new behaviors or a new creation? That's the ultimate question. And the simplest way this was asked in the Bible is, have you been born again? So if you're new here, you know, and you're expecting, I don't know, seven laws or seven steps to make your family happier, you know, enjoy your job more, get a raise, manicure your lawn, whatever. You know, I don't have anything like that. I'm just going to point you to Christ and say, you know, all these standards, you know, that you think Christians have, some of them might be true, but none of them are the ground of why we think we have peace with God. What scripture teaches is that we look to Christ, trust that he took the penalty for our sin, he lived in our place, and that through looking upon him, having faith in him, we have union with him, which changes us. But our change is a fruit of what he's done. It's not the root that earns what he's going to do. And so if the worship team wants to come up, I'll close this in prayer. <clears throat> so Father, we, we thank you. We thank you that you've offered us your son. We thank you that he's died for our sins, lived for us, and that he rose again to prove that it was finished. We pray, Lord, that we would look to him and be more and more made into new, a new creation as we look forward to the ultimate recreation of the world that we're designed for. So I pray that we would walk in this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>